Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I'm a Brazilian economist. Nobody's perfect, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, interested in the yellow cards. If you can show me <laughs> two minutes before. I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm a strong believer that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I have to say, I, when I heard Brian's intervention, I felt a little bit like Danny Kay, the American comedian that once went to a conference and before him, the Indian ambassador made a wonderful speech. So when he came to the podium, he just said, I wrote that speech. <laughs> because most of the points that I was going to make, he has already made. But, uh, but I think, uh, let me just emphasize a, a little bit some of these aspects from the perspective of a multilateral organization like the World Bank. I'm going to talk about the shocks to the system, and I'm going to revisit the question, is this something that uh, it's temporary, or are we in a new type of environment? And uh, in the paper that was distributed, uh, starting with uh, September 11, so the heightening of security concerns, the question of the growing importance of emerging economies, the recent developments on the financial crisis, the implications for global governance, and leaderless movements, as I would characterize the growing importance of these movements. All of these pose significant questions for organizations like the bank, for civil society, for governments. And I would say there are different frames of mind. There are people that have what I call the Niagara Falls frame of mind. You know, the waters above and below Niagara Falls are calm, but the transition is a beach. So some people say, well, we are in this transition, but we'll go back to a normal situation. I would submit that that's not the case. That we are in a situation of rapid waters where flexibility by everybody will be required for you to survive, be it an NGO, be it a multilateral organization. Of course, people may just, uh, let's say, do cosmetic adjustments for self-preservation. But I would argue that unless organizations adapt and interact in a different manner, we are going to have serious problems in this new environment because it is an environment that I would submit will be characterized by continuous shocks, okay? So, there is a paper by a psychologist from Harvard called Josh Miller, which is, he wrote this in the 1950s, but it's a paper that I like very much, which is called Seven, the Magic Number, Plus or Less Two. The whole point is that typically you can remember seven digits, seven random digits. That's why AT&T in its numbering uh, uh, system for telephones, initially you had seven digits. Most people can remember seven digits. Old people like myself, minus two, up to five, and genius up to nine. So I'm gonna make just five points. And <laughs> My five points will be about the new actors. It will be about the financial weakness at the core of the world economy. It will be about the rise of citizen voice and power. The changing roles of CSOs in the development space. And last but not least, I'll have to make an advertisement for the World Bank or I will be fired. So these will be the five points that I'm going to make. So, with respect to new actors, and these points were already made, but just to illustrate the situation, in the 1940s, immediately after World War II, industrialized countries were responsible for 80% of the world GDP. Nowadays, uh, we are in a very different situation, actually, Developing countries are already responsible for 50% of the 
of the growth in world GDP and are getting, depending on how you make your classification, very close to 50% of global GDP. This has implications for governance, for instance. Uh, last year, I was responsible for the negotiations for the capital increase of the World Bank. And this led to significant change. China nowadays is the third largest shareholder in the World Bank. So it's the United States, Japan, and China now above Germany, above France and UK. A major change, and also we had increase in India, we had increase in Brazil, not as big as China. Now, this poses, and several of you already mentioned issues of sustainability, dramatic challenges for societies around the world. Just think, nowadays China has an income per capita of something like $4,000, okay? If we believe in the projections, by 2030, it's very likely that it will be four times bigger, an income per capita of $16,000. This change is the equivalent of adding 15, one five South Koreas to the world economy. Can the world economy absorb this change? What are the implications for sustainability, for climate change? So these are questions, and uh, uh, one of the previous uh, in interventions made the case that uh, we should not have, let's say, linear projections. It's more or less like a what I would characterize like the Elvis Presley challenge. When Elvis Presley died in 1977, there were 40, 40 Elvis Presley impersonators in the United States. <laughs> By the year 2000, there were 40,000. <laughs> if you see the rate of growth is more or less 29% per year, and if you just project this to the future, by 2025, one in every four Americans is going to be an Elvis Presley impersonator. I would submit this is not going to happen, okay? But it's what sometimes people make the mistake of just projecting linear growth in the case of China. But no matter what you believe, it is a major, major change. It has major implications in terms of development thinking. Nowadays, I used to be the director of economic policy and debt at the World Bank, so debt management was a big issue. People were much more interested in learning in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, from the experience of Brazil, Mexico, or India, than from Europe or the United States. If we go to a country nowadays to talk about information technology, they want to learn about the Indian experience. If we are going to talk about budget, budgetary participation, they want to learn from the Brazilian experience, and so on and so forth. So, South-South exchanges become much more important, and these countries, of course, are also becoming much more active in the aid space. How much? Well, the numbers are debatable. But one thing that I, we can say is that we have a situation in which the monopoly of the old donors represented at OECD DEC is being contested by new models. And here, a question to all of us, are these new models better? Because you could say, well, it's better because you don't have conditionalities. Great. On the other hand, often they come with tie-ins to natural resources. What is going to happen in the future? It's an open question. It's a question for all of us. I have two minutes. Okay. <laughs>